Um, and thank you for organising such a vibrant meeting. It's been a lot of, lot of fun. Um, um, a lot of people contributed to this. It's a long story, so I haven't got time. Uh, there's no space on the first slide or time to read them all, and, of course, a number of different funding agencies. And I have to just uh, point out the conflicts that may be, that may be um, relevant. Uh, Theranostics funded part of the work and my travel expenses, and King's owns the THP intellectual property. Um, so we have Gallium 68. Is it the new Technetium 99M? And many of you um, may not be experienced in the in the um, in the day-to-day -day production of Technetium radio, uh, radio pharmaceuticals. But Gallium 68 has a short half-life. It's a almost pure positron emitter, potentially versatile, generator-produced. What's not to like? It's, it's, it may have everything. Um, and going back to the 1970s, Technetium generator and kits revolutionized nuclear medicine in um, making it possible to do this on a routine in, in just uh, any, any district hospital. Uh, and this made molecular imaging with SPECT later on e economically available. Um, and without this, it probably it would never have become such a major discipline. And in most cases with Technetium, all we need is the generator and a syringe and a bit of shielding and a single kit vial, we, and we just put the radioactivity into the vial, and hey presto, we have a tracer. Um, can we do this with gallium? We have a generator. Um, the e ENZ generator uh, got its marketing authorization in Europe in 2014, and others are, are not far behind. And of course, we have chelators that we need to incorporate the, the radionuclide into, into targeting agents. We have lots of chelators. I, I liken it to a bit of a beauty contest of, um, of chelating agents for gallium over the last 10 years. It's a, a plethora of agents to choose from. So if gallium-68 is the new technetium, we should be able to make traces just as quickly and simply using such a kit. <coughs> and this is important because it would enable wider availability in more hospitals at lower cost and benefit more patients. Um, in theory, we can do this. In practice, until very recently, we can't. Um, despite the titles of uh, several recent papers. Um, and I'll explain why I, th I think that the answer lies in the definition of a kit, of course. Um, so current gallium-68 chelators, the established ones, typically need one or more of the following. We've got heat, uh, extra time, acid pH, purification step, automated cartridge-based system. It's not simple. Um, and a one-step shake-and-bake kit, and somebody pointed out that really, ideally, it would be a shake-and-no-bake kit, um, using a syringe and vial would make gallium-68 uh, PET accessible to more centres and hence more patients. So first I, I need to define what I mean by a kit. Is it a cartridge for automated synthesis module to automate a multi-step series of reactions, including the purification? Is it a set of vials and reagents for multi-step manual labelling, including pH adjustment, heat, purification, all the complexities? Or is it a single vial into which you can inject, generate or eluate to produce a final product, just simple one, one or two minutes at room temperature, like, like it used to be for technetium. And of course, I don't consider the first two uh, the simplest option. Uh, this is what I mean by a kit, a single vial, uh, single vial process requiring nothing more complicated than shielding and a syringe. Um, so the answer lies in the chelator, because it is, it's the reaction between the gallium and the chelator uh, that, that uh, is that takes the time or requires the, the pH and the complexity. And here are some of the chelating agents that have uh, become established, by no means all. Um, and some of these, the early generation were macrocyclic chelators, which give outstanding kinetic stability in vivo, but they can be slow to label because of being macrocycles. So we thought change of emphasis is due because gallium-68 has a short half-life and in, in vivo stability over a long period is not uh, the limiting factor. Really, we want to focus on rapid labeling. And we took a leaf out of the book of iron chelators, as some of the other um, non-macrocyclic uh, chelators have done, looking at the similarity between gallium-3 plus and iron-3 plus. They both have the same charge. They both have a very, very similar ionic radius. And but with a collaboration with my colleague at King's, Bob Hyder, who has a long track record in iron chelator design and is the brains behind the uh, widely uh, clinically used iron chelating agent, Deferoprone, which is at the bottom right of that list of structures, uh, we decided to give, that, to give um, the, the, the hydroxypyridinone ligands a go. We, we took three of these de deferoprone ligands and built them into a tripodal system so that we can have a hexadentate coordination 
through the six oxygens. And uh, also produced a bifunctional version with a malayamide conjugated to it. And it, the early experiments were very promising. It seemed to, it seemed to be able to radio label with gallium under very mild conditions very quickly. So we decided to look into this in more detail and compared it with a bunch of the other chelators that were, that were um, becoming prominent um, in the last few years and to do a kind of a competition. And we had two approaches. We measured the labeling efficiency at progressively lower and lower concentrations on the basis that any old chelator will bind gallium uh, perfectly well if you have enough of it present, but only the good ones will, will, will work at a very low concentration. Under fixed time and temperature conditions and pH, various, various different conditions. And the second was when we've identified the better ones, let them fight it out head-to-head. Uh, -head. Put them both in a test tube in a one-to-one -one stoichiometry, add gallium-68 and see which one labels by HPLC. So this is a, a summary of the results at just one pH. This is, this is pH 7 for uh, the, the titration to lower and lower uh, concentration. So as we go along the x-axis, we're starting at one millimolar at, at the left and ending up at 50 nanomolar on the right. You can see that the dota, the light blue, uh, fades away quite quickly at fairly high concentration. Uh, nota is, uh, and uh, trap ligands are not far behind, but a group of them, all, all non-macrocyclic, uh, actually not, uh, some non-macrocyclic ligands survive at, at, till quite low concentration. And if we take the um, this concentration where the, where the biggest distinction between the ligands which, uh, occurs, which is 500 nanomolar, and plot the results, we see that actually desferioxamine uh, and THP uh, perform the best at that, uh, at that low level, both established uh, iron chelators. And some of the macrocyclic ones fade away very quickly. So picking out some of the better ones uh, for competition, this is, the, this is where we put two ligands in a test tube and let them fight it out and, when, and uh, analyze the results by HPLC. Um, so here's an example. This is the, uh, the, the as, as we heard earlier on, uh, the H-bed chelator um, forms a number of um, geometric isomers, so we don't get a single peak on the HPLC, but nevertheless it is characteristic. And desferioxamine is the second one down there, which is almost a single peak. Um, if we put those two together at pH 7 we, uh, or pH 4, we see essentially a, a mixture of the two. We see all of the peaks for both DFO and H-bed, and pretty much the same results happen at pH 4 and pH 7. So that's just there to illustrate the methodology. Um, summarizing all of the results for all of the head-to-head -head comparisons that we've done, um, actually DFO doesn't perform so well for reasons that we don't understand, and I'll come to that on the next slide. But the THP ligand um, performs uh, well in all of these competitions, perhaps because the kinetics of, uh, of binding is so fast. So uh, the worst result was, that, um, was a 92% win for THP over NOTP, but all the others were 99 or 100%. Uh, uh, the gallium went, went to the THP in preference. And there's a whole array of other data there, um, which um, I don't have time to go through. Um, there are some anomalies, of course. DFO performed very well in the first assay, but not so well in the second. And, of course, it is complicated that there, there are pH effects. We, we have, we're looking at a, not really at a... This is not a, a kind of um, rigorous chemistry experiment. We're not focusing on either kinetics or thermodynamics. We're looking at a balance of the two. Um, there are contaminating metal ions uh, derived from the generator, especially titanium and uh, quite a bit of lead. And these will have different affinities for the different chelators, so there'll be different levels of competition. The experiments illustrate a practical situation rather than uh, a theoretical chemistry approach. And of course, also with different um, processing steps after generator elution, uh, with different solvents, uh, uh, solvent containing general, generator eluates may give different results as well. Um, <clears throat> still, we stuck with the, with the THP because of this easy labeling, and, it's, and, and just, this, this slide is here just to illustrate one additional interesting uh, property, it can chelate gallium in vivo, uh, including gallium that is already um, attached to uh, transferrin in blood. So this experiment involved um, injection of gallium acetate directly from the generator, uh, waiting 45 minutes, and you can see 
slow blood clearance during that 45 minutes. And then at 45 minutes, we inject a small amount of the THP chelator. Um, we, it says 20 micrograms there, but we've gone and uh, made this experiment work as low as one microgram. And now, at that point, you see sudden clearance of the blood uh, and the whole body uh, very quickly through the kidneys into the bladder. So that chelation can take place in vivo very quickly. And when we analyze the urine by HBLC, we see peaks, uh, the peak corresponding to the THP gallium complex. So what can we do with this? Um, well, we've, we've conjugated it to various uh, bi, uh, bifunctional linker groups, so um, a maleamide, uh, an amine, which is the uh, precursor for other um, bifunctionality, uh, isothiocyanates. We've also modified uh, very recently uh, the chelating part by taking away one of the methyl groups on the nitrogen. Um, um, so to just give us a little bit of choice when it comes to lipophilicity and coordinating abilities and as opposed to describing that downstairs. Applications, um, we've conjugated it to various peptides to, to demonstrate the principle. All of them label in a single step at room temperature. So um, somatostatin analog, um, an RGD peptide and various more complicated derivatives with three peptides or another one which I've not shown from Michelle Ma, which has got three of the chelating agents as well. So just to get very esoteric. Uh, we can label proteins, and because of the mild conditions, pH 7, room temperature, um, we can label proteins, so you can label a whole antibody. If there was ever a need to label a whole antibody with gallium-68, that's really just there for proof of principle, but very potentially useful for, for antibody fragments, where the biokinetics is much faster and suitable for the uh, half-life of gallium-67. And we can label proteins, again, in a single step by taking a conjugate and just adding gallium, and you get... 95-plus uh, percent yield. Uh, and this, this example is an anti-PSMA uh, single-chain antibody fragment uh, which, which targets the, uh, the prostate cancer. So uh, labeling proteins is a probably uh, a unique um, uh, capability. So the most... You, he you heard about the, uh, the clinical uh, trial yesterday with, uh, with the THP-PSMA conjugate. This is the molecule, the, the standard uh, THP targeting agent with the chelator attached. Um, in mice, it, uh, with tumors expressing PSMA, it behaves more or less indistinguishably from the H-bed. Um, similar high level of kidney uptake, you can see the tumor, similar, similar target to background ratio. The, the H-bed conjugate data are not on the slide, but they are very, very similar. Um, on the, some of the data are also on a poster downstairs. Um, and it can be labelled on a simple kit basis. You, have a, you, can, you can have a kit that contains sufficient material to label uh, with the entire elution uh, volume from the Eckert and Ziegler generator, which is five mils. Um, so it contains the, the conjugate and some, some bicarbonate to neutralise the acid and some buffer to finally uh, control the pH. Two-minute incubation gives you essentially 100% yield, uh, so there's no need for any further purification. Um, and we can do the same with the IRE generator, which has an elution volume of one mil with a slightly modified kit. And <coughs> um, just to take it to the extremes, you can actually have an evacuated vial version, which you just plug onto the end of the generator so there's no uh, minimized finger dose, minimize the risk of incorrect volume man manipulation. Just elute the generator directly into the vial, and the kit is ready um, and passes an ITLC test. So that is what we call... That's what I call a kit-based labeling. Now, of course, THP uh, is one of uh, several new ligands that may be able to um, produce this kind of uh, easy solution. Um, and it's, uh, the, the point is the principle of making uh, labeling very, very simple. And I'd be, just before finishing, I would like to just return to the topic of technetium and rhenium because that's where the, that's where the kit principle came from. But the simple chemistry, the simple manipulation that you do with technetium hides some very, very complex chemistry, much more complex than with gallium. So these, the old DMSA kit and DTPA and the, and the bisphosphonates, they all have unknown structures. The mechanisms of the reactions by which they're produced are a complete mystery. Um, they're a mixture of compounds, and they certainly wouldn't be acceptable nowadays. So it seems that gallium has, uh, has now leapfrogged technetium because we now have both simple chemistry at the molecular level and easy to execute. Um, and I think 
looking at what's happened with technetium chemistry in the last 15 years, which is essentially nothing, um, we now need new technetium and rhenium to go with it for therapy uh, to catch up with the molecular imaging area because there is no syringe and vial method for technetium labeling method, uh, labeling of peptides and proteins, which, which is like the new uh, era of, of nuclear medicine. So with that thought, I'll, uh, I'll finish and thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, uh, Phil, and apologies for moving you across town. It is, of course, King's College London, not University College London. Thank you. I didn't even spot that. Yes. Yeah, so, um, and I also neglected to uh, introduce my uh, co-chair for this session, um, Pab, sorry, Prab Tacker, uh, from uh, the South Australian uh, uh, Health and Medical Research Institute in, in Adelaide. Um, this paper is open for any questions. Perhaps I'll start, uh, uh, Phil. Um, how much activity do you think you can put into to these vials and, and still get uh, labelling efficiency? Well, with the, the, the entire illusion of the, of the generator, with the generators that we have, I mean, and, and one day we, put, we may have higher capacity generators with more activity and, and we don't know how that will perform. But at, at the mm. present time, all of the activity of the generator can be, can be uh, managed with one vial. At that level, we have to have a score bait in the... Uh, in the kit to, uh, to manage uh, autoradiolysis. So the recent uh, developments with uh, both solid and liquid targets producing um, gallium-68, uh, which will potentially produce curies uh, of, uh, of, of gallium, do you think that... Uh, how far could you go with, with this sort of kit? These base? things are just completely unpredictable. Um, we will just have to try, and we, we, we have um, collaborations in... in, in, in being planned to, to assess that, but um, at the moment we're limited by what you can get out of a generator, and, and at that level it's fine. Um, I have a question as well. So the marketing authorization that you talked about with the generators, do you think that's important? Uh, I don't think it's a matter of whether I think it's important. This, the regulators will do what they will. Um, it, it obviously has been important because the, uh, um, the Many centres who are not so research oriented will uh, will not adopt um, these things unless there is regulatory approval. So, um, for the really for the mass market, which which is what we're aiming at with the with the kit principle, I think it is important. So you're applying for a marketing authorization for the kit as for well. For the kit, yes, absolutely, yeah. So, Rich. Uh, yeah, um, I just was curious. Uh, the animal study when you injected the excess chelate and showed the clearance through the kidneys. Did you measure any um, other uh, electrolytes? I've just, I'm, I recall that some of the old EDTMP data, calcium levels could drop if there was an excess of chelator. And, um, uh, you know, obviously to have an efficient reaction, presumably you're going to have excess chelator. Uh, have you measured those, and is it an issue? We, we, we haven't. Um, it may be an issue if we, if we find a clinical application for such a procedure, but we know that the selectivity for the chelator for, the, for gallium and iron of the, these chelators is very high. They don't bind calcium. They don't bind any other metal to any degree. We know that if you inject a significant, significantly larger amount of the, of the chelator into mice, you start to see iron-bound um, THP in the urine, and you can, see that, you can see the color of it. So it does have the same effect on iron as it does on gallium, but on other metals, um, we haven't measured it, but, but the affinity of the chelator for, the, for any other metals is, uh, is almost nothing. A few old guys in the audience like me remember using gallium-67 for, for imaging lymphoma and melanoma. Uh, do, you, do you think that, uh, and one of the problems there was we had to wait 24 hours or yeah. so for blood clearance um, from the, the transferrin into the tumour and, and, and liver. Uh, do you think that uh, potentially you could uh, concatenate the imaging period by giving uh, this, this to clear? This is one of the reasons what be behind the experiment. I mean, one of the reasons behind the experiment was, was we accidentally did, an, did a, a, ser a plasma protein binding experiment where we added the reagents in the wrong order, and we, and we discovered that the, the THP could take gallium that was already bound to transferrin, and that was a, a surprising property. But actually, if you look back in the literature, Matthew Thacker has done the same thing with desferioxamine many years ago. And so we would, um, we, we did anticipate that that would be an interesting application, but so few people use gallium-67 um, or gallium-6, the, the lymphoma targeting uh, application of gallium these days because 
FDG came along that, that um, we thought perhaps that would um, not be so interesting. But, but it turns out on traveling around and talking to people that people are still interested in that, in that uh, type of imaging. So um, certainly um, we would be want, we would, if that is a serious application, then we would want to compare with things like desferioxamine and uh, deferoprone to see what, what would be the ideal chelator for performing that function. There's no further questions, we'll move on to the, uh, the next talk. And <laughs> Thank you, Jeff.